morning, everybody. Uh, so I guess I'd like to thank Fred and thank all of the university sponsors, NYU, University of Chicago, Columbia, the CPC, all the, the NIH, all the great people that brought us together today. You really are an impressive crowd out there. So um, Fred asked me to talk about the relationship between education and health outcomes. Uh, and let me start out with a confession to Fred and to you. Um, what should I say? I never really went to school to learn any of the things I'm going to talk about. So I'm feeling a little nervous up here, but uh, please help me out. And in fact, um, you know, I work with demographers a lot. I never took a course in demography. Uh, my first job was in school health in Baltimore. Uh, I was the school physician for the system in the late 80s. And um, I never took any education courses. I also never took any social work courses. Um, and one of the first jobs I had in Baltimore was dealing with the integration of kids who were HIV positive into that school system. Um, and you know something? Nobody knew anything about HIV back then because it was a new disease, because we were learning as we were doing. We knew there'd been a, a young man out here in the Midwest who hadn't been admitted to school, but nobody knew what to do. Um, the lucky thing I had was I had a lot of good friends who were smarter than me, who guided me in, in, in many paths, and I had to learn a lot on the job. So anyway, so I'm gonna tell you about what I learned on the job over the last 20 years today. How's that sound? Okay. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is, I'm not going to talk about intervention, although I think everything I say is going to be related to interventions, but I'm going to try to describe the relationship between education and health, because I think those are, it's a really fundamental and a very important association. Um, the second thing I'm going to try to do, talk about is how education influences life trajectories leading to HIV and other health outcomes. And my, I studied pediatrics and then I studied adolescent medicine. I often confess I'm sort of a recovering adolescent. I never wanted to leave, so. Uh, but I have an affinity for that age group. And uh, it's an age, you know, Mary's already talked about the importance to youth of education and succeeding in school. So I'm gonna talk about some of those issues. And, and in, in between, I'm gonna try to weave together a few ideas about things like life transitions and trajectories and life goals for young people, uh, some issues about effective HIV prevention, and um, educational and social policy uh, interventions. Although, again, I'm unqualified, so raise your hand and correct me if I say anything wrong, okay? So what the heck is education? I mean, how many of you believe in education? Anybody here believe in education? A couple of you? A couple of you still haven't had enough coffee? Okay. Uh, why? Is it better to be educated or uneducated? Okay, it's better to be educated. But why? What, is, what does education give us? What? It's empowering. Mary says it gets you more money, you know, when you get your first job or over your lifetime. You make more money. Is it a pleasure? Yeah, it's fun to learn, right? You know, and I'm, I'm part of that Frank Zappa school, having been raised in the 60s, you know, that said if you really had any guts, you'd drop out of school and go to the library and get yourself an education. But I won't say anything more about Frank. So, you know, if you look at the literature, what does it say? Education is a really strong predictor of health status. So if your parents are better educated, you have lower infant mortality rates. If the mom is better educated, there's lower maternal mortality. And it's related to all sorts of health outcomes, cardiovascular disease among adults, just about everything. So knowledge, I think, really is, education really is knowledge, and things like health literacy, because you actually learn something about health in school, or if you're reading the newspaper. Um, but it's also, so, somebody said, it's, it's empowerment. It gives you a set of social skills, intellectual skills, to figure out how to solve problems. And again, 
I did have a pretty good education. I have to thank a lot of people for getting me where I am. But a, a lot of the best thing they taught me is how to keep on learning. Because again, there's going to be a new disease, there's going to be a new social challenge, and we're not going to be ready for it unless we know how to learn our way out of it. Okay. So again, the research suggests that rising educational access and attainment around the globe as part of development is really part of improving health status. And I'll show you some data in a minute from the work we've been doing in, in Uganda. It's also perceived as a gateway to social advancement. And do parents pester us to go to school? I've got two adolescents at home now. So I had to try to get one of them up yesterday, and he didn't really want to get up. Uh, and his, his, my wife is even better at pestering the kids to get to school. But families really push kids to go to school. They really sacrifice. And what we hear from Uganda, it's one of the biggest uh, sources of family expenses, is to send their kids to school. And many, many in the middle class in Chicago and New York also are having those kind of uh, intervention, uh, having that kind of attitudes and perceptions. And political leaders support it too, although we could get into a long debate about that, maybe over coffee or beer later, but um, let me leave it at that. Finally, it's, it's a really important part of what my friends call the demographic transition. So what's the demographic transition all about? So yeah, so we had high mortality and high fertility, and then they Mortality went down in fertility, you know, okay, so there's all that kind of nonsense. But, um, but it's also part of a trajectory, particularly for young women, but also for young men, of staying in school, delaying childbearing and marriage, and increasing economic opportunities. Again, for young women particularly, but also for young men. So it's part of a social change that's really important, and that's what we see going around, uh, we see in Uganda, but we still see it in New York, and we still see it in, in the inner city in, in the United States. So it's really a, an important transition, and Marion Wright Edelman said the best, the best contraceptives is a bright future, so that's part of it as well. Okay, so when it comes to adolescence, there's a bunch of ways of measuring this, and I love measurement studies, and you know, uh, Forgive me for that, but we think about educational achievement, we think about staying in school, we talk about connected to school as a social institution. Kids who feel they belong in the school do much better in life. Uh, they do better in their education, but they also do better in terms of health. And we think about things like the educational attainment of parents. We know in adolescence, all of those indices, if you will, are related to less um, risk taking and risk taking, you know, risk taking gets a bad rap, right? How many of your parents? How many of you want your kids to take risks? Ooh, that's a that's a tricky question, right? You do sometimes, but you want it, you want them to take risks in a certain, what should we say, socially acceptable realm. You like the challenge. They do like to, you like to see them challenge themselves on the basketball, or maybe in in band or something but maybe not, you know, uh, in the drug environment out on the streets. But risk-taking is a normal part of adolescence, Ex exploration, experimentation. We would be uh, deceased as a species if young people didn't take risks, okay? But, you know, when it comes to health, certain health behaviors, they set you up for smoking, drug and alcohol use, risky sexual behaviors, they set you up for a lifetime of poor health. Okay, and finally, you can also trace it to uh, health outcomes. There's lots of, of barriers to education, though. I think we've heard about them already. First of which is poverty, and how does that work? And it works in many ways. It means parents can't, are struggling and can't get you to school. Parents may not have the, the school fees which is an important part of they may not be able to buy a school uniform. There's a whole set of reasons. Orphanhood is a very kind of special problem that Fred has looked at and we've been looking at in Rakai as well. Your parents disappear, what does that mean? 
and you know, Fred had an extended family that picked up, picked him up and picked up a lot of kids in, in Uganda, but at some point the, the stress of orphanhood becomes too much. Family instability, school failure. So kids who don't do well in school don't stay in school. Surprising if the school as an institution is failing, um, kids are not gonna do well. And importantly, access to schools is a problem. And that was the first thing I had to learn about Uganda. Uh, I understood the school literature in the US to some extent, but it's different. In, in, in Uganda, there aren't places for many of the kids. There, there weren't schools. They hadn't built the schools. Or they hadn't equipped the schools. And so um, government support is really essential, something we learn about civic classes in the US. So there's actually a special case when you come to HIV. And again, you all know adolescents are at risk of HIV the whole world round, right? Okay, I won't have to say that, that bit of the epidemia. Early, early studies, particularly in Africa, suggested the best educated people were more likely to get HIV. Now is that a bit of a paradox? Because generally it's always the poor, the poor people that get the disease first. If you look at the epidemic in the United States, HIV is increasingly a, a problem of poor and minority groups. Again, because of that lack of economic. So why was HIV higher, often among the best educated? It goes back to this issue of economic empowerment. People had more money, perhaps, to have more partners, okay? And importantly, nobody knew what HIV was in the early years, in the 80s, when that ep epi the epidemic was full blown before anybody knew what was going on. So what we see now is a reversal of that trend. The best educated people, the people in, in sub-Saharan Africa that are, are, are perhaps, mo are now, we're moving in the direction or have the, the lower risk, okay. So I, so I stole a couple of Fred slides. Uh, so I think the observational literature that I've been talking about, and I'll show you some more in a minute, really support the kind of work that he's doing around economic empowerment. Because children growing up in poverty, in most cases, remain poor. That uh, poverty itself constitutes an important risk factor, as I've just shown you, for physical health um, and risk taking. Poverty is related to mental health functioning. We oftentimes don't measure that in public health as well as perhaps we, we, you do in social work. And poverty negatively, negatively impacts a family's ability to care and support children. And so Fred has been working, I think he's already showed you this slide, um, this sequence of increasing economic resources, financial stability, increasing access and engagement with education, and what you see is better education allowed, and importantly, Fred, you left this off your own slide. You know, he works with the families fairly directly, because you can, you can support a young person, you can provide an economic intervention, but if you don't work with families, you're not gonna be as successful. Okay, let me turn to Uganda. Um, and, uh, you know, Fred and I joined Columbia about the same time, I think. And I didn't meet Fred for like the first seven years I'm at Columbia, just because it's such a big, confusing institution. And then it turned out we work in this, not only the same country, but we have offices in, in, in Rakai, which are about, you know, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred yards apart. But anyway, so Fred's taught me a lot about, about Uganda in the last few years. It's got a population of about 35 million. The prevalence, and I think this is the old prevalence, is 6.2, it's now more closer to 7%, 7.2%. 7.2% of the adults in that country are HIV positive. I mean, that's lower than many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, but think about how many people that is. There are 1.2 million orphans in that country under the age of 18. So, and again, orphanhood there is predominantly you lost your parents to HIV, right? Okay. Um, so the Rakai district is pretty rural, and I'm a hick. I grew up in western New York, far from the big city. Um, 
I feel very comfortable there, but it's a predominantly rural agricultural area. It was the site of a lot of civil wars. Does this thing have a pointer? So uh, when the civil wars occurred, all the soldiers were marching up and down from Tanzania. So it was a, it was a period of great social disruption. And it's, the, and it's also on the major north-south trucking routes um, in and out through East Africa. And because of that mobility and that civil unrest, it was a major, um, so it was a major, it was a first jumping off point for the AIDS epidemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so-called slim disease uh, was discovered in 1984 and then found to be HIV. Um, and so a series of health programs have been formed there, particularly the Rakai Health Sciences program, which I've had the privilege to be part of. And again, it's where uh, Fred started some of his early work. So why are young people at risk for HIV? Well, you can, you can go back to all the behavioral explanations. They initiate sex early. They have a, a large number of partners or a, uh, increased number of partners, those are the ones at risk, or they engage in sexual concurrency. We, we could claim that adolescents are inconsistent about their use of barrier protection, but probably adults are worse. At least the, many adolescents at least try. Um, it's related to things like male circumcision, male medical circumcision, sexually transmitted diseases, and community prevalence. But importantly, so those are the sort of immediate risk factors, those behaviors and conditions. But it's also very much a consequence of poverty and things like commercial sex work and what drives people into commercial sex work, of power, power dynamics in relationships and women's equality, and again, educational and vocational opportunities for young people. And sex ed is in there somewhere, and I've done a lot of work on sex ed, but I'll skip that today unless somebody asks me a question. So the Rakai Youth Project, Rakai had been there for, when we started with them, almost for 15, 20 years. And what we added was a, a focus on young people. And we were very interested in understanding the changing patterns of HIV infection in Rakai among young people. And understanding what, I, what we like to call as a continuum of biopsychosocial risk factors for HIV incidents over time. We were also very interested in exploring prevention policies. And Uganda was an early leader in prevention, HIV prevention. Museveni, when he took off his fatigues and left the guerrilla army and became the president, identified HIV as a problem. And there's nothing like political leadership on, a, on an issue to help you move it forward. So he provided early political leadership on HIV prevention, he also provided very important early leadership on education. And his policy of universal uh, primary education has been transformative in some ways for, for Uganda. And we had a mixed methods survey. This is for, is Allison still here? Yeah, yeah. So NIH likes mixed method, you know, use of existing cohort data. So we got all that scientific stuff. Um, and this is, can you, anybody see that and with the, bright lights coming through the window. So we were, we were interested in, obviously, the behaviors and the conditions over here, like p partners, but we we're also interested in individual situations and social context, because those drive HIV infection. And right here in the middle was school attendance. This, is, this was actually on the early, what should we say, conceptual framework for the project although I hadn't met Fred yet, so I didn't really understand how important it was. And I'm gonna skip some of the details today. It's, uh, this is, so I'm, some of the data I'm gonna show you is this open cohort, which means we follow people in villages between the ages of 15 and 49. We follow them over time, so we interview them this year, we come back a year later. So we can look at changes over time, we can look at you were HIV negative, and then we came back and you were HIV positive, so we can understand transmission dynamics. But we also look at things like schooling and look at trends over time. So I'm gonna show you some of the interesting trends around HIV that we're finding. 
And it's a great, it's, I should say, it's a great example of community-based participatory research, where the community is really involved, and the project brings back many things, as Mary was talking about, in terms of services, in terms of both prevention and treatment services. And so, uh, what more can I say here? We're, I'm gonna look over, basically survey data for about 20 years in the youth survey. We also did a bunch of formative research, and you know, Mary talked about a number of techniques for involving young people in research. Too often, I gotta say this is true in, in public health, too often we talk about young people, we don't talk with young people, and so research that gets out and tries to understand the voice of young people, or even the voice of parents, because we assume things about parents, but we don't necessarily talk to them, is essential. And so we had a couple phases of looking at what we call life history interviews and then uh, looking at prevention programs to try to understand from the point of view of young people and adults in, in Rakai what's going on. Um, so our first study, this is the results of the first study, and I'll save you most of the data, but I'll show you a little bit. We found the classic risk factors for HIV. So it was multiple partners and sexual concurrency, which are par having partners from over the hill in another community. Things like marital dissolution, so young women who marry early, and by their 20s, their marriage has already fallen apart those young women are at very high risk. Living in one of those trading villages, and remember I talked about the truck routes, that puts you at higher risk. Having an STD and alcohol use is a great cofactor for lots of social problems. So we found the some of the typical risk factors, but we were really struck by the impact of school attendance. Staying in school was a huge protective factor against HIV, and here we're measuring new infections, so we could line up, essentially, the educational trajectory and the HIV trajectory, but it was a huge and very important, particularly for young women, it was a very protective factor. Um, and then we did some, let me show you some of the qualitative research as well. So that's the first, study. the second study, I'm gonna do these, I've got three or four, I'm gonna try to spin them together pretty quickly. So we asked young people what were their aspirations for school and work, and we asked them about marriage and love and childbearing, a lot of things, but I'll show you just a, a snippet of this. So we asked them what they, where they wanted to go, and young people, irregardless of their HIV status, all wanted to finish school, go to university, and they all wanted to be teachers or nurses, I mean, we were shocked. In some ways, it was the middle class ideal. Uh, but what they also told us was most of them, many of them were unable to finish school and get that job because they couldn't, they couldn't continue in school. And the primary reasons they couldn't uh, stay in school boiled down to two. The first of which is we didn't have any money in the family. And related to that was my parents died or my mother died or my father died and I couldn't stay in school. And orphanhood, um, using the definition of having lost either parent or both parents, is about 50% in the Rakai community. It's begun to come down recently because of ARV treatment, but it was 50% for much of the period of time I'm gonna show you the data from. We also looked at marriage and again, young people are amazing. Maybe it's just that they, they report what we want to hear sometimes. But they overwhelmingly had middle class, should we say, aspirations about marriage and children. They all wanted to have big families. They all wanted to have a church wedding. And again, poverty tended to prevent that and because one couldn't enter into the officially sanctioned marriage, you saw all kinds of risk behaviors, multiple partners, because one couldn't engage in you know, the, 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 the goal, if you will. We, we then went ahead and did a, a second qualitative, a quantitative study looking at 
how things got better. And what we found was many of the traditional risk factors for HIV, particularly in the last 10 years, declined. So sexual experience, multiple partners uh, were down, circumcision was up, male medical circumcision. We also found considerable increases in school enrollment, and that seemed to be very tied to HIV risk. So the biggest decline, and I think I've got the, oh, this is really hard to see, but you can see at least this red line is going down, that's teen women. So, so we saw an 83% decrease in HIV incidence in Rakai, seemed to be overwhelmingly related to delay in initiation, and where's the delay in initiation coming from? Primarily because young people were staying in school. And they realized that that was a, staying in school was not consistent with having sex and getting HIV. Okay, so let me show you a couple more. We've now looked at it over a broader period of time, looking at uh, particularly the school increase. And this is the unbelievable increase. So in, uh, these are age-specific rates of, of being in school, school enrollment. This is for young people. It looks the same for young men. Um, but you can see uh, at the, the youngest age group, 15-year-olds, went from 50% to more like 80%. 17-year-olds uh, went from 20% to uh, about 55 percent. So in many ways, education has doubled and tripled in Rakai, and again, it's reflected in, um, uh, it's reflected in those risk behaviors I mentioned ago. So we're now trying to figure out what's predicting schooling. It, it appears to be poverty, it appears to be orphanhood, it appears to be government policy and economic development, and we hope to look at parental education. And I'm getting the, the hook, so I'm gonna, uh, wrap it up. I learned a lot in, in the last 20 years of 30 years of public health. Uh, the first thing I had to learn though is to keep learning and creating opportunities for young people to keep learning is probably the best thing we can do and uh, congratulate Fred for creating those opportunities and, and you all for, for doing the work you do. Thank you.